Good morning, church. Today, I'd like to take you on a different journey. Full disclosure, I'm not a pastor, I'm an engineer. So, I look at uh, the meta-narrative of this book, perhaps from a different perspective. And this morning, I'd like to share that with you, that of a creative, innovative, loving God. A God constantly seeking to re-establish friendship with his most innovative creation, at least known to mankind. A creation quite edgy, quite radical actually. In today's terms, it would be as ethically controversial as building a weaponized robot running on new version of AI software that's not really been tested yet and with no antivirus protection. You got it. Free thinking humanity. And to add insult to injury, a hacker's on the loose. That's Lucifer. In agile business startup principles, the heuristic of fail fast, fail often by Ryan Badino is well ingrained. You develop something, and if it doesn't succeed soon or within the expected time of positive return on investment, drop it and move on to another idea before you hemorrhage too much money or other resources. God, however, is so in love with his startup, that is humanity, that he is willing to lay down his life, as John 15, 13 through 15 states, at the risk of huge collateral damage like losing his own son. No, not a good business plan in today's startup economy. Taking a deep dive into the narrative of this startup experiment that is called humanity, we see a creative creator God forming human in his image, not just physical, but also imparted with a desire to also create and innovate. This presumably failed startup has every so often some sparkles, remnants of the power and creativity revealing its inventor, shown throughout history through music, art, craftsmanship, and seen often as superfluous to the stoic or empirical evolutionist scientist. Individuals in every domain are driven to innovate to survive. The concept of innovate or die was coined by the father of modern business management, Peter Drucker. This concept cannot be truer or more urgent than now under this COVID-19 global pandemic crisis. Being agile, or the ability to quickly pivot and adapt to new priorities and ways of life to survive, is something we can definitely learn from this pandemic, not just for an MBA or a startup. The first industrial revolution used water and steam power to mechanize production. The second industrial revolution used electric power to create mass production. The third used electronics and information technology to automate that production. The upcoming fourth industrial revolution is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital and biological spheres. We stand at the brink of the fourth technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, we work, we relate to one another. In its scale, scope and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has been exposed to before. Down the road, history might attribute this pandemic as the catalyst that makes it mainstream. It was Plato who famously wrote our need will be the real creator, which was molded over time to the English proverb, necessity is a mother of invention. You see, crisis can also be looked at as an opportunity. Crisis scenarios through innovation causes change in the way of life. It's a mistake to think of innovation in a strict technological sense. Innovation is not only inventing new machines. It's also the process of creating value by applying novel solutions 
to a meaningful problem. So value plus a novel idea and a solution to a problem, that's where re innovation resides. The longest prophecy in the Bible given to a pagan king is related in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 31 through 35. As Adventists, we assert that the head of gold is the Babylonian Empire, which lasted until 539 BC, followed by silver, the Middle Persian Empire, then bronze, the Greek Empire, then the two legs of iron would be Rome, the feet of clay and iron would be the kingdoms of Europe, and the stone that breaks the statue is Jesus' second coming. Indulge me in re-examining this prophecy through the lens of um, human creativity and innovation. The first few metals of the statue are reminiscent of the Olympics. The prize for first, second and third in some kind of a race. If we look at the Babylonian Empire in Mesopotamia, preceded by the Sumerians, they invented quite a few interesting things. Uh, first of all, the wheel. Initially, the wheel was used to grind, not as a mode of transport. Later on, the wheel was used for chariots. The cuneiform writing system was quite innovative at the time, a progression from pictographic to highly conventionalized and purely phonetic for conveying information over long distances in trade. Cuneiform was so developed that uh, they even had dictionaries and lexicons. Another innovation from the Babylonian Empire was a mass production of bricks, discovered by German archaeologist Robert Cloudway as he excavated ruins of Babylon in 1899, and he found impressive walls and buildings and described the place as a great seat of learning and culture. The Ishtar Gate can still be viewed in Berlin at the Pergamon Museum. Irrigation was another one of their innovations in the foundation of mathematics, Counting of time, 60 seconds, 60 minutes, 12 months. They counted on a base 60 inherited by the Sumerians, and they used uh, those 12 knuckles on their fingers to count. Moving on to, to silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, which lasted up till 331 BC, they brought to the world the first declaration of human rights, which gave almost equal rights to women. They also invented windmills, refrigeration, and air conditioning, mind you, with no electricity. Uh, also, algebra. The postal system was another one of their invention. Herodotus' description of the Persian mes messenger system was, whatever the conditions, it may be snowing, raining, blazing hot or dark, they never fail to complete their assigned journey in the fastest possible time. Another one of the Medo Persian inventions was the highway system. Darius's Persian network of roads for speed and travel between capital cities was quite impressive. And on a fun bit, they started birthday celebrations, the guitar, and hmm, dessert. Represented by bronze in the statue, the, the Empire of Greece, which ended in uh, 168 BC, brought in quite a lot of, uh, of innovations as well. First of all, the scientific method, that's during the time of Aristotle. An observation that leads to a question, then a hypothesis, then a prediction, an experiment, and theories and refined predictions. Evidence-based medicine, no fake news there, and the Hippocratic Oath. Another one of uh, the innovation was uh, democracy, the concept of voting and philosophy, geography, cartography, optical telescopes, lighthouses, including the one they built in Alexandria in Egypt, arch, bridges, steam engines, and uh, um, also a rudimentary railway system. They also invented the locks, and they built a precursor to, to the Suez Canal. Theater was a big thing, pre-written tragic, dramatic, and uh, comedy, um, 
still stands today in writing. Showers and central heating was another one of the inventions. They were clean. Clock towers, alarm clock. <coughs> the way they did alarm clocks was a clepsydra that dropped a pebble on a gong. And uh, quite interestingly, the first analog computer called the Antikythera Mechanism. Moving on to iron in the statue depicted by Rome, which started in uh, 168 BC, they brought in modern plumbing, sanitary management, like sewers, aqueducts, concrete, although it's debatable because the Bedouins in North Africa was also were also using some sort of concrete. Uh, they brought in efficient roads, very, very straight roads, and roads that could withstand time. They um, brought in a very efficient postal system, and uh, one of my favorites, the first newspaper. It was not really paper. It was a large stone slab where they would inscribe current affairs, and they would place those slabs in public areas. This was called the Atta Diona, uh, or the daily events. And another invention of the Romans was the Codex. That was the first bound book ordered by Caesar. When we look at the feet now, um, the kingdoms of Europe, we can see quite a lot of innovation still going on today, but I'd like to highlight uh, just a couple here. First of all, the discovery of electricity by uh, Michael Faraday, um, discovering induction back in 1831, followed by Alessandro Volta in Italy and Nikola Tesla, the Austro-Hungarian, Slavic, and André Ampère from France. Radio came along through Guglielmo Marconi in 1894 from Italy, then television by John Logie Baird in 1926 from Scotland, and the World Wide Web with Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an uncanny trend that all these empires, these nations, contributed tremendously towards facilitating one thing throughout history and building on each other's innovation in the area of communications. Tools that facilitate the propagation of news and information, including fake news, but also of the story of a perceived failed startup where the principal investor and inventor and creator, against any business acumen, falls in love with a defective product and gives up priceless assets like his son's omnipresence just for the eventuality of hanging out with this edgy invention that is humanity. Reminds me of the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. From the message uh, translation or interpretation, and it says, Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this day after day after day right up until the end of the age. We have reached this point of technological advancements in communication that reaching the whole world, every people, kindred and tongue, is very achievable. This fulfillment of the Great Commission is happening. So, here we are. An originally pretty cool and edgy invention, creation of God, with a lot of potential that, for the most part, at least from a humanist perspective, are on a self-destruction path of no return, taking down with us other creatures and also the only spacecraft that sustains life as we know it. Infected with a pandemic of sin, we have no chance against that virus. While humanist thinking like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos believe that the only solution to the survival of the species is to start colonizing other planets or downloading of the human consciousness onto computer chips to attempt to achieve immortality, at least according to futurist Ray Coswell. Well, the Bible, 
which happens to be the instruction manual for this startup that is humanity, does point us to the assurance of immortality and also intergalactic travel. But um, what's even more mind-blowing is that this is done through accepting an undeserved friendship with our creator rather than buying a one-way ticket to Mars. Back to the concept of innovation. There are four degrees of innovation. Sustaining, evolutionary, revolutionary, and disruptive. Sustaining innovation doesn't cause any change to its current vertical market. Evolutionary innovation, on the other hand, brings some improvement to the product in the existing market. At the revolutionary level, we can see unexpected innovations applied to the existing market. Disruptive innovation creates a new market, that's great, but it's at the expense of the previous market. Not so great if you are the business owner of that disrupted market and did not foresee the new development coming. It's important to comprehend that disruptive innovation does not make a product better. It transforms the product in making it much more affordable for the mass population. At the time of the horse and carriage, if Henry Ford asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. By inventing the affordable car, he disrupted the horse and carriage market over time and replaced it, perhaps unintentionally, with the automobile market. Let me illustrate. From a storage perspective, some of you might be familiar with a 8-inch floppy disk. Uh, nowadays, you could hardly fit one picture in those. As technology progressed, it evolved into the 3.5-inch floppy disk, which could hold quite a lot more information than the 8-inch floppy. Uh, so that was definitely evolutionary. Then we moved into a revolutionary uh, method of storing data. That's the USB key. A uh, lot more storage, of course. And now we're familiar with cloud storage. But that disruption keeps on going into storing data on uh, DNA. And the latest, coolest platform for storing data is on something called metabolomes. When we look at the industry of uh, just data storage, companies like 3M and BASF, they, are, they were petrochemical companies that made the magnetic substrate for the floppy disk. So as soon as it went, uh, storage of data went to the cloud, they were not able to make money anymore in that industry, and hence it was disruptive for them. Other examples that we can see in the industry are um, what Uber and Lyft is doing. That's disruptive to the taxi business. What Amazon and um, in some other countries Alibaba uh, is doing is disruptive to the high street shops. Hotels compared to what Airbnb is doing. Banks and maybe what cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin might be doing. These are all disruptive to those well-established businesses. Now, what about church? What is disruptive to our church? We'll come to that later on. I'd like to illustrate two examples of innovation in our church. In my late teens, I used to live in southwest Michigan. Most Sabbaths, a church historian by the name of Mervyn Maxwell would organize an afternoon trip to Battle Creek, about a little over an hour away from Berrien Springs, where I used to live. And uh, it would be a historical tour of Adventist pioneers showcasing Kellogg's, James and Ellen White, and so on. I used to hop along as often as I could because the anecdotes related by Professor Maxwell never got old. One such anecdote that I really liked was how James White would uh, print the present truth, started in 1848. Back then, they used to use hand-operated printing presses. He would take twice the time to print some of his present truth uh, articles. He would 
ink the machine with black and print the regular page without the title and then wait for all of that to dry and then reprint all the pages with blue ink and just have the title in blue. That seems pretty trivial nowadays, but back then when uh, those papers were being distributed, it really caught uh, that innovation of having just a blue title and a, and a black text really caught people's attention initially and uh, they were quite keen on reading the content. Another one innovation that I'd like to share with you is one by um, a Brazilian young girl by the name of Ana Fortes. Oh. And uh, um, she runs a, quite a popular YouTube channel on describing certain concepts that she has picked up either through her Sabbath school lesson and so on. Ana uses a simple webcam for her weekly recordings. Now, you might say, there's nothing innovative about that. But uh, for her age, I'd like to differ. And she's had quite a lot of followers, 78,000 to be exact. She has an uncanny ability to take pretty complex theological concepts and making them quite accessible by her non-church-going friends. <laughs> Quando nós a colocamos na água, ela recebe toda a mensagem de Deus e compartilha. Curtir e compartilhar. Que tipo de cristão você é? Eu sou Ana Júlia do blog anajufartes.com.br In conclusion, I'd like to highlight three areas where we can definitely innovate ourselves in our church. At a macro level, our administrative systems and methods were often designed in the era of the horse and buggy, and maybe train for transportation and post and telegraph for written materials. It is time maybe to rethink our administration in the light of new transportation and communication means. On a micro level, Looking at our church, inertia can be a terrible thing. As we are just starting to de-lockdown, catching up with just where our local church was pre-COVID, rather than getting ahead, is like a person rebuilding their house the same way it was before a storm, knowing that it will break again the next time a similar storm comes along. That reminds me of the story of the foolish man building his house on the sand. And it conduces to a situation of feast or famine and no right, no in-between. Dr. Reinder Brinsma, on his blog, recently paraphrased Hermann Bavink, a Dutch Calvinist, as follows. To praise the old because it's old is neither Adventist nor Christian. And on a personal level, We've got to appreciate that God gives each of us talents and creative minds. The quantity distributed is less of an issue than how we all use our talents. See the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. Sometimes we can be afraid to use our talents for God, fearing we're not good enough or people will make fun of us. But if we're willing... God can give us the courage and inspiration. As Paul instructs, do not become formed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans uh, 12, verse 2. The scientific term for this is neuroplasticity. The ability for the brain to change has been rooted in God's design since creation. So let's take advantage of it. Following the Israelites' escape from Egyptian captivity, God commanded Moses to build a tabernacle. The people donated their jewelry, their cloth, uh, their precious metals and stone. And um, Bezalel and Ohalib were chosen, really ordained, for their skills and artistic craftsmanship to head up the design and construction. Exodus says that the people were willing to do the work. Much effort was involved. Many people want to have success with their talents immediately, but you'll never excel at anything without learning the basics. Musicians have to know the foundations of chords and rhythm. 
Builders should know engineering concepts that keep structures strong. Artists may know the fundamental elements of colors and shading. Writers and speakers need to know grammar basics. While it may seem boring at the time, learning the basics is necessary to master a skill, even if you have the talent. And when God provides inspiration, don't wait to act. Part of the creative process is obedience to the vision God gives you. And if you do not act, the inspiration may disappear before you capture it. This reminds me of the analogy between a cruise ship and a battleship, minus the war aspects. While a cruise ship paying customers are there for entertainment, on a battleship, Everyone has a role and strives for excellence and collaborative efforts as part of one mature body as expressed in Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. I'd like to end with the story of Zach. He was a rather unremarkable student at Cambridge University when the pandemic hit and he had to go back to his family home in Grantham. The day-to-day -day routine of quarantine life was very different from the rigor of being on a university campus. Zach settled in a new, unstructured way of thinking and behaving during quarantine that freed him up to make rather interesting discoveries. He began experimenting with prisms, then continued work on some math problems he had begun at Cambridge. And finally, after being bonked on the head, by an apple falling from a backyard tree, he developed an interesting theory, one that would fundamentally rock our understanding of our world. The year was 1665. The pandemic that was sweeping the land was the bubonic plague. The pandemic eventually ran, ran its course and Isaac Newton returned to Cambridge with his new work in hand the once unremarkable student was granted a fellowship within six months. That year is now known as Newton's Anus Mirabilis, or Year of Wonders. His first discovery was calculus, born from his continued work on math problems, that with prisms led to his theories on optics, and from the incident with the apple allegedly falling from the backyard tree, Newton developed his theory of gravity. Welcome to the fourth industrial revolution. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to help shape our new ball community for the future, to make disciples of Jesus and expand God's kingdom with your God-given talents. Will you join me?